Okay, let's uh, look to God in prayer, and we'll begin this morning. Now, Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you so for all of your blessings, and we thank you, Lord, that you went willingly to the cross and died for our sins. And we think at this time of year, Lord, we think about your birth in Bethlehem. That was a miracle, Lord. It was a fulfillment of the prophecies in the Word of God. And the Word did become flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And we thank you, Lord, that you came and became a human being and died for our sins. Now bless this time in the Word, we pray. May we get to know you better through the ministering of the Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, um, we have been talking about the revelations that God has given to the Apostle Paul. He gave him many revelations, but basically there were the three. There was the dispensation of the grace of God. If you notice on your note sheets, Ephesians 3, 2 is one, one place where he talks about this. He says, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me for you, or you word, he says it was given to me. And so it was a special revelation given to Paul about this age or dispensation of grace. And in Colossians 1.25, he says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. So it was given, this revelation was given to Paul for Paul in turn to give it to the church. We have it today because Paul under the uh, uh, influence of the Holy Spirit, recorded it in Holy Scripture. Then secondly, the gospel of the grace of God was also given to Paul. We read about that in the first chapter of the book of Galatians. But in Acts chapter 20, he says that uh, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He received the gospel as a, div uh, as a divine revelation given to Paul for the church. Now the third part of this is what is called the mystery. And we're not really going to get to the mystery this morning. We'll get into that next time. But the mystery this morning, we, uh, we're going to consider the revelation of the mystery. And in Ephesians, if you notice on your note sheets, in Ephesians 3.3, 3, it says how that by revelation, here is the divine revelation once again, he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in a few words. Now before we get to the mystery that was given to Paul, we're going to look at 14 other mysteries that are recorded in the New Testament. The New Testament is a book about mysteries, but these are all mysteries that are revealed. There's none that, there's no whodunits amongst these mystery stories. This is all mysteries that have been revealed to us by God. And early in Scripture, way back in the book of Deuteronomy, God explains that which is a mystery. And, a, and let me say it again, a Bible mystery is one that is revealed. The mystery is revealed. Before it was revealed, nobody even knew it existed. And that's the way it is with the dispensation of the grace of God. Nobody knew about it. The gospel of the grace of God, nobody knew about it, and the, myst and the mystery itself, nobody knew about it. But let's use a, a parallel here from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, right at the bottom of the first page there. He says, for this commandment. Now the context here is talking about the Ten Commandments, that which was given or revealed to Moses, just as... Uh, spiritual truth was revealed to Paul to give to the church, there was spiritual truth revealed to Moses to give to Israel. And uh, God here is talking about the commandment, these commandments. And he states here, for this commandment, which I command thee this day, is not hidden from thee. And it goes on and says, neither is it 
far off. Then he says, it is not in heaven that thou should say who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it down that we, uh, that we may hear it and do it. Then he says, neither is it beyond the sea that thou should say who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. But he says, the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. So here is the definition of a Bible ministry. It is not something that is far off. It is not something that is hidden. It is not something that is in heaven. It is not something that is beyond the sea. It is something that is very, as he says, very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. So there's no mystery here at all. It's all been revealed. Well, that is kind of like, in fact, very much like a New Testament ministry. Now, just using this example from Deuteronomy, um, he's talking about the commandments. These commandments came to Israel through Moses as a divine revelation. Nobody knew about them before. For instance, you, you read in the um, early chapters of Genesis, Cain goes out and kills his brother Abel. Well, there was no commandment against that. And there was no commandment against stealing. There was no commandment against committing adultery. There was no commandment against uh, lying. There was no commandment against coveting. No commandment against honoring your father, and uh, uh, telling you to honor your father or your mother. There was no commandment about worshiping other gods. Those were all revelations that were given by God to Moses for Israel. And so the parallel here is the revelations that God gave to Paul for the church. And so uh, in, this, in this passage in Deuteronomy, the singular pronouns are used, thee is used three times, thou is used three times, and thy is used two times. And then the plural pronouns, the uh, word we is used twice and us is used four times. So who, who is God talking here? He's talking to everyone, everyone here, individually and collectively together. Because before Exodus 20 was given, that that's where the Ten Commandments are found, it was a mystery. And now it is revealed by Moses, or through Moses, to the, to the, um, uh, to the world. So it was something that was previously un unknown. It was an unknown truth that is now made known. So when we come to the New Testament now and we read about a mystery, the mystery is explained by Jesus. Now the Apostle Paul use that passage in Deuteronomy, and he quotes it. He doesn't quote it exactly, but he quotes it in Romans chapter 10. And he says, But what saith it, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. So he's, he's saying here that this, this is, the, uh, uh, this is the, the word that has, has come to us that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So this is a mystery that is revealed in, in the New Testament. And in this case, it was revealed through the Apostle Paul. Now, Jesus talked about mysteries when he was here on earth during his earthly ministry. And altogether, we find 15 mysteries in the New Testament. And we're, we're going to just mention each one before we're done here this morning. But first of all, when Jesus talked about the mysteries, and notice in Matthew chapter 13, verse 11 and verse 13 here. He answered and said unto them, they had asked him why he was speaking to them in parables. And he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they seeing, see not. And hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. So that's what a parable is. A parable is given for the people of God, those who are tuned in to the heart and mind of God, 
they can understand it, while the rest, the world, the lost, they cannot understand it. Now, you know, one of the uh, unique events in history was just before the Civil War down on a southern plantation. There was a, a Negro slave down there, his name was Nate Turner. And Nate Turner um, organized a revolt of the slaves. And the revolt did not just take place on the, the plantation where he worked, but he was able to communicate with slaves of other plantations that were close by. Now when the revolt took place, it wasn't really a big thing. They kicked up a lot of dust and, and, and uh, a few people were killed and the revolt was very quickly put down. So historically, it wasn't a really a, a big mom, uh, momentous event. But the reason it's in the, in the history books is because for a long time, nobody could figure out how Nate Turner was able to communicate with the slaves on the other plantations around him. And then one day, they found out how he did it. And the way they did it was through music, the Negro spirituals. And the words of those spirituals were like a parable. They had a meaning that everybody that heard them could hear, but they had a hidden meaning that only those that were tuned in could understand. And many of those Negro spirituals, for instance, steal away, steal away, yes, steal away to Jesus. There was a coded message in there to steal away or run away. And they would communicate this way. And the old uh, uh, spiritual, uh, go do, Moses, go down the land of Egypt, tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. There was a hidden message in there. Let my people go. This is going, we're going to, we're going to go. We're going to be, going to be free. And so they used these the uh, uh, spirituals, the, the, the realm of music, they used it to communicate a hidden message. The slave owners could hear them singing. They heard every word that they sang, but they understood none of it. Well, this is the way when Jesus spoke these parables, he spoke them to saved people and lost people. They were both there in the congregation, but only those that belonged to him, only those that had trusted in him were tuned in and they could understand, they could decode the message, and that is the, the reason that he spoke to them in parables. Now, if you notice in that parable, Matthew 13 there, he says, you and them and they. You, meaning God's people. Them and they, the lost people that were there. Now, we have it again. This is the same parable in Mark chapter 4, verse 11. He said, unto the, uh, he said unto them, unto you, here's the, his elect here, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without. All these things are done in parables. Them that are without. What does that mean, them that are without? Well, you, you let the Bible interpret the Bible. And in Revelation 22, 15, he says, For without are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Them that are without. Those on the outside. Now, in the Gospel of Luke, he again it records that same parable. And in Luke chapter 8, verse 10, here's how it reads. He, he said, um, and he said unto you, talking to his disciples, unto you it is to given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others. Here he refers to them as others in parables that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. You and others. These are the two, uh, two uh, groups to whom the parable is given. To you, his disciples, and to others. And again, using the Bible to interpret the Bible, who does he mean by the others? Well, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14, uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 13, he said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as, here's our word here, even as others. Who are others? Which have no hope. 
others which have no hope. He's talking about when, when a person dies. A Christian, he says, just falls asleep, so don't sorrow for them. You know, it's okay to sorrow. He didn't say you shouldn't be, be sorrowful at a funeral. He says that's okay, but don't sorrow as others. Don't sorrow like lost people. I've been to funerals where uh, the loved ones of, of a lot, person that has died, where none of them are, are believers, I have just seen just carrying on, sobbing and wailing and, and carrying on. They are others that have no hope. And um, so th that, that's who he's referring to here as others. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, here's another example. Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Here's the others. So the others here are lost people, just as it says those that are without, are those, those that are outside the, the house of God and, and the, uh, the, the kingdom of God. So in the New Testament, these 15 mysteries are for the believers only. And these 15, 15 mysteries can only be understood by believers. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishly, uh, foolishness unto him. It's like the slave owners on the plantation. They heard the songs. They heard the words of what was being sung. They heard all of this, and they didn't understand any of it until the revolt, till well after the revolt took place. So we're going to look at a list here of New Testament mysteries, and then the next two times we're together here, uh, we're going to deal with the mystery that, that Paul talked about and wrote about so much. But here's the first mystery that is mentioned in the Word of God. It's the mystery of the kingdom in its, the, the mystery of the kingdom in its mystery form, Matthew 13, 11. And he answered and said unto them, because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. He's talking about here the church, the church which did not exist. Do you know, John the Baptist never went to church in his life. Jesus never went to church in his life when he was here on earth. The church didn't start until Pentecost. But Jesus talked about the church. He talked about, taught about the church, but he did it in mystery form. And he, what he spoke outwardly was all about the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. But in mystery form, he prophesied, talked here about the church. And so we find here that the church was concealed by Jesus in these parables, these seven parables of Matthew chapter 13. The ch they're about the church, but the church is concealed in there. And so it's a, here it is a mystery. And Jesus said, it's a mystery here. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. It is revealed, however, by the Holy Spirit. Concealed by Jesus, revealed by the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul. So it was concealed by Jesus. It was revealed by the Holy Spirit through uh, the Apostle Paul. So uh, we, we have that revelation. Now the second mystery that we find in the Bible is the mystery of Israel's blindness and the fullness of the Gentiles. And we've talked about this in, in other times before. But in Romans eleven twenty five, he said, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. What is it? That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So here is the second mystery, that God's elect includes Gentiles. You see, the church, when it began, was 100% Jewish and remained 100% Jewish from Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, right on through into the 8th chapter of Acts. And in the 8th chapter of Acts, we had some Samaritans get saved. They were half Jew and half Gentile. But those were the first ones that were not totally Jews that were part of the church. And then two chapters later, in Acts chapter 10, 
the Gentiles, God, God sends Peter to the house of Cornelius, and Gentiles uh, get saved. And from that point on, it has been mostly Gentiles that get saved. And the church today is probably 99.9% Gentile. And the fullness of the Gentiles is that very last soul that will be added to the body of Christ. The moment that you get saved, you become a part of the body of Christ. This is a New Testament revelation, which, by the way, was given to us through the Apostle Paul. He's the only one that wrote about this. Nobody, none of the other uh, New Testament writers even touched this. This was a divine revelation given to Paul. And the very last, there's going to be the day coming when the very last soul is going to be saved. You know, that could happen today. It, it could happen right in this church. Somebody could get saved today at 1130 service, and that would be the very last complete the body of Christ, and the rapture would take place, and in the moment, in a twinkle of an eye, we'd be in glory. It could, it could happen. We don't know when that's going to happen. But this is a, a, a mystery that is revealed to us through the Apostle Paul. In Matthew 13, it was a mystery spoken of by Jesus, but here we see a mystery revealed by the Apostle Paul. Then, thirdly, we have the mystery of the church in the end times, which constitutes the rapture and the resurrection. And in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 51 and 53, he, uh, Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. This is a mystery. He's the only one that has ever written about this. You won't find it in the Gospels. You won't find it in the book of Acts. You won't find it in the epistles of Peter or Jude or, or John or anyone else. This is a, mis a mystery re um, revealed by Paul. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And then he talks about it again in 1 Thessalonians, where he says that the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, clouds of the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. He's the only one that ever wrote about that. And that, that's the only reason we know about that is through the Apostle Paul. These are one of the abundance of revelations that he spoke about. You remember 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he said he received the thorn in the flesh because of the abundance of revelations that were given to him. And so just about everything connected with Christianity comes to us through the Apostle Paul, but he paid a price for those divine revelations he had a, a thorn in the flesh which uh, troubled him till, till the day he died. God never healed him from that thorn in the flesh. And then number four, here's another, here's another mystery that is revealed to us through the Apostle Paul. The mystery of the church as the bride of Christ. Who would ever have thought that the, that the church would be called the bride of Christ? And then he, this is in Ephesians 5, 28 through 32. And uh, he's talking about, he's giving instruction in marriage, telling uh, men to love their wives as their own body. And then he brings it to a conclusion. He says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Well, we read that way back in the book of Genesis. They will become one flesh. But then here's the mystery that is revealed. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The relationship between the husband and wife is a parallel between Christ and the church. We become one flesh. And so there's mystery number four, that the church is the bride of Christ. Who else wrote about that? No one in, in the entire, uh, entire Bible. Okay, then uh, uh, where we are here now, the... Um, the mystery of the indwelling Christ is the next one, that Jesus lives in his people. We read this in Colossians chapter 1. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and generations, nobody ever knew about it, 
but now is made manifest to his saints. And that's, as we said, that's what a Bible mystery is. It's a mystery that's solved. It's a mystery that has been revealed. No whodunits in God's mysteries. He tells us who done it each time. It's now made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, here it is, Christ, not with you, Christ, not for you, Christ, not by you, but Christ in you, the hope of glory. That the Son of God personally indwells his believer. That's why Paul could write in, in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. It's a mystery that was revealed to us, given by God, revealed through the Apostle Paul. And then we read um, number seven here, the mystery of God's redemption for lost humanity, and that mystery is the cross itself. The cross itself, the preaching of the cross, is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18 tells us that. Okay, what is this mystery? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, he says, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. And he says, Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Pilate was a prince of this world. He didn't know about this. Herod was one of the princes of this world. He didn't know anything about this. And Caesar was one of the princes of this world. He didn't know anything about this because the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And so here is this, this, the wisdom of God in a mystery that Christ died for our sins and his, the shedding of his blood is sufficient to purchase for us eternal redemption. The natural man cannot ever understand this. He never will be able to understand it. 1 Corinthians 2.14 tells us that. And so they ridicule the cross. They make fun of the cross. They make light of the cross, not knowing that it is the cross is God's plan of redemption for, lo for all of lost humanity. Then we come to mystery number eight. Raymond, the mystery, pardon me? Did I miss six? Oh, the Godhead, yes, thank you. <laughs> All right. The mystery of the Godhead in Jesus Christ, okay? And this again comes through Paul. Colossians 2, verses 2 and 9. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father, and of Christ, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The fullness of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all in Christ. Don't try to understand it. <laughs> it's beyond human comprehension. But it is a mystery revealed to us by, by Paul. All right, let's go down to number eight there. We'll catch up here now. Mystery number eight, the mystery of godliness restored to mankind. Man is so far short of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are so far below God, what God wants us to be. It's like comparing the, the height of a fence post to the height of a distant star. I mean, that's how far, that's how far we've come short. That's how big the gap is between God's righteousness and our righteousness. So how is this uh, uh, gap to be bridged? How are we to uh, find out what godliness, how are we to attain godliness? Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, he says, this is a mystery. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. That's how he did it. That's how this bridge was the gap was crossed and this is how godliness can come to to humanity 
God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus is that bridge between the holiness, the righteousness, the deity of God, and the sinfulness of lowly man. He's the bridge. One God and one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2.5 tells us. Okay, so the mystery of godliness. This is how we can become godly. There's nothing godly about us. Then number nine, the mystery of how the tribulation is going to end. And this doesn't come through Paul. This comes through John. This is in the book of Revelation. Remember what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit? He said that when the Holy Spirit has come, he will testify of me. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then he said, and he will teach you all truth. That's the New Testament epistles. And then he said, and he will teach you things to come. Well, that's the book of Revelation. So there in the book of Revelation is a mystery revealed through John given to the church. Revelation 10, 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. The mystery of God should be finished. That's how the tribulation period is going to end. And uh, uh, the, uh, this is the, the, the prophecy there of the last days. The prophecy of the last days. Okay, then, um, then we come to, to, um, to, number, to number 10 there. Um, Number 10 is the mystery of God's eternal kingdom. And this, like most of the others, comes through Paul, his eternal kingdom. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. The mystery of God's will. What is God's will? Well, he's made known. It's not, it shouldn't be a mystery because it's a revealed mystery. The mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, that's the kingdom, the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. This is a mystery that is revealed to us that shows us that the kingdom the future kingdom, earthly kingdom of Jesus, is going to include the redeemed of all ages. That includes the church. Adam and Eve will be there, and Abel will be there, and Noah will be there, and Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and Solomon, and Isaiah, and Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, and, and all from all in, in the past ages, the redeemed of God. They're all going to be there. Israel is going to be there, the redeemed of Israel. The church is going to be there, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he's going to gather together in one all things in Christ. This is the mystery of his will revealed to us through, uh, through God himself, through, through the Apostle Paul. Then the next one, number 11, is about the uh, stars and the candlestick which is a revelation of the church and the pastors of the church. And this one comes through John in the book of Revelation, the mystery of the seven stars. What are these seven stars and the mystery of the seven candlesticks? Revelation chapter 1 interprets them for us. He says, the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. He said, the seven stars are the angel or the messenger to the seven churches. Seven church, the church here is represented as a candlestick. And that's a good description for a church because a church has no light of its own. What does a candlestick do? It holds the light. Now, where is the light? If this local church here is a candlestick, and, and the book of Revelation is written to seven local churches, so each local church is a candlestick, okay? Where is the light? Turn with me in your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 8. The Gospel of John, chapter 8. We're going to look up three passages of Scripture here. You might want to jot them down. Uh, John, chapter 8, and verse 12. Then spake Jesus again and said unto them, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. 
oh, well, Jesus is the light of the world. Yeah, but wait a minute. Go over to chapter 9, just one chapter over. John chapter 9 and verse 5. Jesus modifies that statement. He says in, in chapter 9, verse 5, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. In chapter 8, he says, I am the light of the world. But in chapter 9, he says, that's only as long as I am in the world. Well, he's not in the world now. The world crucified him. and He rose from the dead and returned to heaven. So he's not in the world today. So who is the light? Where is the light in, the, in that candlestick? Well, turn with me again, this time to Philippians chapter 2. The book of Philippians chapter 2. And in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul, again, here's a revelation coming through Paul, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Who is the light of the world today? It is God's people. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, but I'm only the light of the world as long as I'm in the world. And he says, you are the lights of the world. In fact, Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 5. He says, ye are the lights of the world. A city that sit on a hill cannot be hid. We're the lights. The church, this local church, is the candlestick that holds the light. But you and I are the lights that is given out from this place. How bright are we shining? That's the, que that's the question. So here is the mystery here of the seven stars and the seven candlesticks that we are the light of that world. Daniel chapter 12, Daniel says, they that turn many to righteousness will shine as the stars forever and ever. Then we come to mystery number 12. And here we find Satan's program for the last days. It's a mystery that is revealed. And again, it's revealed by Paul. 2 Thessalonians 2.7, the mystery of iniquity. What is this mystery? Well, whatever it is, Paul says, it's already working, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. And then he says, only he, and he's talking about a person here, he. Who's he? Well, this he is the Holy Spirit. He's a person, and he's working to combat the mystery of iniquity. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And that word let means to restrain, to hold back. And the only thing that is holding back gross immorality, wickedness and godliness, the perilous times that the scripture speaks of in the last days, the only force that is holding that back today the only force that is restraining Satan from revealing the Antichrist right in this time or any other time, the only reason the Antichrist has not been revealed is because of the Holy Spirit. He's restraining that. And he's going to restrain until the proper time, and then the scripture says that he might be taken out of the way. When he is removed, literally all hell breaks loose upon the earth because there will, Satan will be unrestrained and all the demons of hell, all the fallen angels, the evil spirits, they will uh, rise in mass against humanity during that, during that tribulation period. So this is the mystery of iniquity. Now in when Jesus gave the parable about the mysteries of the, of concerning the church in Matthew 13 there, here we have one that's, it's, uh, that bears this out. Notice Matthew 13, 33. This is the, the church here in its mystery form. Another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Leaven in the Bible is a symbol of wickedness, immorality, ungodliness, 
Leaven is never spoken of as anything good in the Bible. The Jews were not to have leaven. Not only were they not to eat leaven, but they were to not even have it in their house. Leaven is a form of fermentation and corruption. Bread made with leaven, which we would use yeast today, but bread made with leaven is the bread rises. It's a fermenting process. And by the way, that's why at the Last Supper, the uh, bread that was used was unleavened bread because it represented the body of Christ and there's no corruption in the body of Christ. Just as the, what was in the cup was not fermented wine, it was grape juice called the, in the Bible the fruit of the vine because something that was fermented could not represent the blood of Christ. But that's another story. But at any rate, the leaven here is, always speaks of evil and corruption. Now in the 23rd chapter of Leviticus, is where God gives the feasts, seven feasts to Israel. And we have the benefit of hindsight that when we look at those seven feasts, we can see God's prophetic program played out in type through the uh, celebration of those feasts. For instance, the first feast was the Passover. And that speaks to us of, of the cross. Jesus is called our Passover, 1 Corinthians chapter five. He, uh, he's our Passover. And then uh, the second feast is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And this shows the pureness of the blood of Christ, the body and blood of Christ, because it took a pure sacrifice to pay the price for our sins. Then the third feast was the Feast of first fruits, which typifies Jesus' resurrection. The, he, he, be, he is called in 1 Corinthians 15, the first fruits of the resurrection. The first fruits is a type of, of the resurrection. And then 50 days later, 50 days from after the Feast of First Fruits is what is called the Feast of Weeks, or as it came to be known, the Feast of Pentecost. And here's what the scripture says in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23. It says, even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, seven Sabbaths, that's 49 days, shall ye number 50 days. So 49 plus one makes 50. And ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. You shall bring out of your habitation two waved loaves of two tenth steels, and they shall be a fine flour. Then he says, and ye sh they, sh they shall be bacon with leaven. This is a feast of Pentecost, the beginning of the church. This is a Old Testament type of the beginning of the church. And it's the only place in the Bible where God says to his people, eat leaven. It shall be baked with leaven. What is that symbolizing? That the church from its very inception contained leaven. The tares were in with the wheat, the sheep were in with the goats, all mingled up together right from, right from the very beginning. And so when in this parable, the woman adds the leaven to the three measures of meal, and it says, till the whole was leavened. The whole lump was leavened. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And what does this tell us? This tells us that in the last days, that the church, there's not gonna be any great revival sweeping across the world like the charismatics talk about. Just the opposite, in the very last days before the rapture, the whole lump is being leavened. That leavening process is going on in the world today. Now in the Bible, leaven is symbolic of false doctrine. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, beware of the doctrine of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He called their doctrine leaven. In Luke chapter 12 and verse one, it is referred to, leaven is referred to as hypocrisy. And in Galatians chapter five, leaven is referred to as legalism. I should say legalism is referred to as leaven. The legalistic, super, super saints, the le super legalistic. It's corruption in the eyes of God. And in 1 Corinthians chapter five, verses, verse uh, six, immorality is referred to as leaven, immorality in the church. And in that same chapter in verse eight, 
Leaven is symbolic of malice and wickedness. So there's never anything good about leaven mentioned in the word of God. It's always evil. And in the parable here, the woman puts, three, uh, puts leaven into the three measures of meal until the whole is leavened. That's a prophecy of the church in the end times. Now right along with that comes another mystery, right on the heels of that. And that's number 13 here. The mystery of religious Babylon, this comes through John, and religious Babylon is the harlot church that exists during the tribulation period. The true church will be gone, but there's going to be a world church. I don't know if it'll have anything to do with the World Council of Churches or not, I have no idea. But there's going to be a world church that will be a vehicle used by the Antichrist to help enthrone him and worship him this world church. And this world church is going to be headquartered in Rome according to Revelation chapter 17. And here's what the scripture says. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abomination of the earth. And reading through that, you, you drop down to that seventh verse, and he says, I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. And that mystery is that it's a harlot with harlot daughters. The harlot mother and the harlot daughters reunited in a great godless, Christless, apostate world church after the true church has been raptured. It's a mystery revealed to us in prophecy. Then number 14, we have the mystery of the gospel. This one comes through, uh, comes through the Apostle Paul, and uh, it's the gospel of the grace of God. Uh, Ephesians 6, 19, As for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my, both, my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And that mystery was revealed through Paul and uh, not, to, not to others. He had, he had to teach the rest of the church. Now, number 15, here is the mystery that we're going to be studying the next two uh, times we meet together. Here it is. The mystery of the church that it is the body of Christ. Here's the big mystery given by God to Paul. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 6. He says how that by revelation, divine revelation, he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, that's because it was a mystery, but is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Here it is, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, that all of the saved people, all in the church, whether they be a saved Jew or a saved Gentile, are going to be part of a single body. And that body, the church is that body, it's the body of Christ. Here is the great New Testament mystery revealed. It's the church is the body of Christ and Paul writes extensively about this mystery Ephesians 3 9 to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ and then he talks about it again Romans 16 25 now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. And again in Colossians 4, 3, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. This mystery, this is the last one we're looking at, number 15 here. This mystery is that the church is composed of saved Jews and saved Gentiles, and they're all together in one body. We're not an organization. The church is not an organization, it's an organism. It's a living body. It's the body of Christ. The church is here on earth. 
The head is up in heaven. Jesus is the head of the body. And when the last soul gets saved, the church is going to be taken up to heaven and the head and the body will be united together. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now in Colossians chapter 1, he says, Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but is now manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, not outside of us, in us, the hope of glory. So these are the 15 mysteries that are taught in the, New, in the New Testament, and we're going to zero in on the mystery, this uh, ministry, uh, mystery of the body of Christ, Jews and Gentiles in one body. That'll be in the next two lessons. Now, some of the church truth revealed by the Apostle Paul here, we've put 12 of them down. Actually, there's 25 of them. And if you can think back to the first lesson in this series, we, get, we had a page, page in there where, and as we gave them, you, you, you're supposed to have write, written them down. And if you still have that page, there's 25 things, 25 uh, truths that is, were revealed to Paul exclusively. Well, here's 12 of them as they relate to the church. The fullness of the Gentiles, the rapture of the church, the church as is the bride of Christ, Christ dwelling in his people, the Godhead, Redemption of lost mankind. Godliness restored to man through Christ. The church is part of the future kingdom. The mystery of iniquity, which is at work even now. The gospel of the grace of God. The dispensation of the grace of God. And the church as one, as one body. Those, those 12 truths are, were given exclusively by the Apostle Paul to the church. Peter, none of them ever wrote about them. And you never see any of those 12 things taught by Jesus. And we have four books in the New Testament about the words of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He never taught any of those, any of those 12 truths uh, when he was here on earth. And then Peter, we have Peter, he wrote two books of the New Testament, plus the first 12 chapters of Acts are all about Peter, and he never talked about any of those 12 truths. And then we have the Apostle John. And the Apostle John wrote five books of the New Testament. He wrote the Gospel of John, then the three epistles of John, plus the book of Revelation. That's five books. John never talked about any of those 12 things that were revealed to Paul. Neither did James or neither did Jude, who wrote one epistle apiece. And so uh, they never heard about any of any of this before. And it was a revelation that was given to Paul. And so the next couple of weeks, we're going to see that great mystery of the church as one body and composed of, of believers, no matter who they are, neither male nor female, Jew or Gentile, bond or free, but all one in Christ Jesus. Okay, we're going to, um, uh, well, we want, we want to talk here for just a second, just real fast, about Peter and how this related to Peter, because Paul had to teach this to Peter. And um, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Peter writes, and this is about 30-some years later, Peter writes and says, at, at account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. So Peter acknowledges that Paul had written unto, the, unto these Jewish uh, believers. In the next verse he said, as also in all his epistles, speaking in, in them of some things in which are some things hard to be understood. He says there's things that are hard to be understood. This is 30 some years later. Peter's still trying to get it, okay? But because he sat under Jesus teaching for three and a half years. And Paul comes along with further revelations and Peter has to learn this and, and he says some of these things are hard to be understood. But then he, um, in verse 17, he writes to these believers acknowledging 
that they already know Paul's truth. He, ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall into uh, from your own steadfastness. And then he concludes by telling them that they need to grow in these things. That's verse 18. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Now Paul tells us that understanding these mysteries, just being able to understand them without the love of God in your heart is worthless. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, I understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity or love, I am nothing. So having an understanding of it is one thing and having love for God and for God's people is something else. So next time we're going to focus on the mystery itself. As Paul says in Ephesians 2.16, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So these are the 12 church truths revealed to Paul. And who besides Paul talked about these things? The answer is no one. He's the only one. And so he is the apostle to the Gentiles. Let's pray together. Thank you now, Lord, for your blessings and your presence with us. Thank you, Lord, for these truths of your word. Help us to learn these mysteries, understand these mysteries. Lord, you said you spoke in parables, so those that are without could hear but not understand, but those who know you could hear and understand. Give us a deep understanding of your precious word, Lord, and a real genuine hunger and appetite that in the coming year that is soon to be upon us, that will deepen our walk with you and grow closer to you till you come again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm.